I'm Brian B. and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Jack Casey. Jack is the founder and producer of The Base Guy Show, which you can find Monday, Wednesday, and Friday live at 1 p.m. Eastern. Today, I want to find out from Jack, how can we treat people better? It seems like a very simple question, but I think he has a true knack in this field. So join me today in my conversation with Jack, the bass guy, Casey. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Jack, bass guy, Casey. Good day, fine sir. Hey, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderfully well. I was just telling you how much I appreciate you taking the time to do this. We've been trying to look at setting this up over the last few weeks, thanks to primarily Mr. Frankie McDonald. Would you be able to do me a favor, Jack, and tell us what industry you're in and what it is you're doing nowadays? Um, I'm in the industry of uh, wearing my pajamas right now and doing my show from home. You know what? So, so am I. <laughs> good. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the internet. it's the lockdown, eh? <laughs> Everyone's in their underwear. 2021 is a great year so far. Not really, but. I had an interview the other day, just <laughs> full tie, shirt, jacket, pajama okay. bottoms. <laughs> hey, perfect. Uh, I'm a musician, though. I'm in the industry yeah. of uh, music and entertainment. I started when I was about 14 years old. So my whole life, really. Speaking of 14 years old, what would have been your very first job that you would have had, whether it was volunteer, just something, trying something for fun, maybe lemonade stand or delivering papers as a preteen or a teenager? The very first thing I started working when I was about 12 and uh, I never stopped. I started delivering newspapers. It was on Wednesdays, the Chronicle in the West Island of Montreal, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Gazette, and I would deliver papers to uh, pretty rich neighborhood. And then I'd have to go collect all the money. And my first real official job was when I was uh, 14 years old. Um, it was really bizarre. I worked at a yacht club because it was close by and I was a bosun. And the, like you go on a little boat and you have a shotgun and you shoot it. And then the, the race, I have, I, have no, I have no idea about anything about sports or boats or anything or guns or anything and or how to drive a boat. And within about a day, I was driving a boat, <laughs> shooting a gun. A gun. <laughs> And marking people's scores. And I didn't have a clue what was going on in my whole life. It's kind of like that movie, Catch Me If You Can. Mm -hmm. You figure out that you can, you can just wing it and you can just like <laughs> go. As long as you're not flying a spaceship, it's going to be okay. <laughs> so that was my first so job. And, and the first job for the bosun uh, thing was the, the guy, like he just kind of took a liking to me, whatever, and he said, okay, here's your job. He goes, there's a pipe under here, under the road. And it was a cement road goes, I want you to dig a hole a foot wide and a foot deep uh, right across the street. And he gave me a pitchfork and I'm a dumb pitchfork. kid and I don't, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm working in the hot sun. And I dug a huge like World War II trench in the ground and I had blister and blood all over my hands. And when he came back, he was like, holy crap, you did it. And then my mom came over and gave the guy crap. And that was my first day of work. He was amazed that you were able to do it. Your mom was shocked that yeah. they made you do it. It's the first time I ever told that story. So that's, I was just thinking of, was it a pitchfork or was it? Yeah, it was like an actual legit, like old school pitchfork, no gloves. And I didn't know what work was. So in my head, I was kind of a scared, <laughs> insecure kid. I was like, oh, okay, sir. You know? <laughs> I was the kind of kid that like when I was seven, I'd bike to school with my brothers and all the kids. And it was like, two miles away and after about a mile i thought i was in the amazon jungle and i was like <laughs> crying as i say in scotland i was greeting me i couldn't too far so on my first day of work i was like well i guess this is what everybody does they, they <laughs> dig huge massive holes in concrete and cut their hands open <laughs> that's why those men that you those hands you shake are so tough I, okay i can do yeah. it too as you were getting up towards high school did you work any other jobs you said you had lots of different jobs but what was a main job you might've had all the way up to high school? Um, I had, yeah, I had loads of jobs. I, I, you know, I grew up kind of poor and things were tough for me. So I had to get my own money if I wanted to do anything. And I, I did paper routes. I worked in little lo local restaurants. My favorite was this guy called Baddie and 
in the Montreal and the West Island baddies. And I would help them clean and cook and do things. And then when I left high school at around 17, I went right into a, a bar and I ended up working in the grease pit. The guy got me down under the bar and I had to clean out the grease pit. It was like the worst, hardest job in the world. I became a dishwasher and I washed dishes instead of going to college, like all my friends, because like I said, I was poor. I washed dishes for about three years straight and then moved my way up to um, like a prep chef or whatever. Yep. But then the, the bar actually had a stage and it became a DJ and then I started a jam night and I would get musicians to come in. So, uh, and even back then I was like in the local paper and I was booking famous local musicians like Michelle Casson, the wild unit from UZEB in Montreal, a big jazz band. And uh, I was always like doing, like I was scraping the grease, digging the holes, being a restaurant person. And then at night I'd go into the DJ booth and then I would do battle of the bands. And then sometimes I would sleep. I'm not even joking. I would sleep on the bar, like, because then I would clean the bar. I'd do all the toilets. I'd clean the chair. I'd sleep on the bar. And I was working 18 hours a day uh, for a couple of years. So that was my education. It's if that's like you're the modern, mo the modern day Batman or, or Spider-Man. Yeah, I, wor I worked hard and I moved out when I was 17 years old and had my own apartment. I worked my whole life and then worked my way up to other stuff. Well, what was your motivation to get the paper out, knowing that you were, you said um, you didn't have a lot of money or poor. And then what, why did you do that? Was that for your own motivation? Was that family kicking you out of the house and saying, go make some money? Uh, it was a bit of everything. I came from a large family. I had a whole bunch of brothers and money was tight. My parents were working class and my, but my dad was like a, he, he, he passed away in 2011. He was a like bit of a genius. He, he knew he did, just didn't apply himself. He was a mechanic, an A1 class mechanic, the highest mm. level of mechanic in Canada. He could fix any truck, car, machine, anything. And uh, on the weekends we'd go drive into the richer parts of town and we'd collect garbage in the morning and my dad would find bits of old bicycle and he would build us all amazing bikes, like really good bikes, not spending a penny. And then he put a basket on my bike and a stand. And then that's how that led into delivering the Montreal Gazette when I was about 14. When you were delivering to the, the richer neighborhoods, was that encouraging or discouraging to you? Were you thinking, it, oh, it, I want to get there. I want to. Yeah, it, 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 goes, it, it goes so far later on in my later life. But yes, the, the, the places I was delivering to were literally, some of them, mansions. So mm -hmm. huge, huge houses. So I knew there was that world, and then there was my world. Mm -hmm. But I, was, I, wasn't, I was too young to be judgmental or mm -hmm. like, what's wrong with the world or whatever. But it became a theme later on in, in my other jobs. It got even more crazy with the uh, diversity of the, the, or the difference of like, poverty and richness and entering those worlds i guess they're codependent on each other but yeah it did it did make me think like how come this guy has 20 20 rooms in his house and we have one yeah with 20 people in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> when you got into high school and knowing that you went into you worked in a bar what were you thinking that you might want to to do. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I just kind of followed along a path, but for no particular rhyme or reason. What were you thinking about okay. what you may want to do? Uh, well, during all that crazy work stuff that was going on, I got my first guitar when I was about, um, well, actually, I started playing drums when I was seven because my dad, uh, even though we weren't rich, he did care for me. And my mom and dad, they were, they were great to me. And they got us a little drum set in the basement. And my dad taught me drums uh, and it took ages. And I finally got it when I was seven. And then I'd invite other kids in and they became musicians. And then when I was about 14, I got a guitar and I was cutting grass. I was cutting lawns with a push lawnmower, like the old school 1987 mm -hmm. or whatever. And I would use that money. Uh, it was expensive too, $20 a guitar lesson back in the 80s mm -hmm. and 90s. So I would I take say guitar that's expensive lessons. now. <laughs> And I used to sit at home and just practice after yeah. school, like five hours, nonstop, one scale, just over and over. I'm dyslexic. So everything I do takes me a lot longer than mm -hmm. the average person, I think. But I just, I have this really dumb, stubborn determination to never give up. Uh, and I've been beaten down a thousand times and I get back up. So I just kept practicing. 
and practicing and I knew I wanted to be a musician. Okay. But the thing I didn't know then that I know now is that especially now, maybe it's good for some people like the industry, like Walt Disney and stuff, Netflix, but being a musician really, really, really sucks. In fact, my advice to any musician is don't do it. Become something else because you, you practice your whole life. You can do tours and be with bands and travel the world. But then when it's over, you got no money. You got, you haven't done the family thing. You're just, you're 40 years old and you're like, Oh, and then when I do my show online, I put my whole life into it. Music's free. It's the internet. You just turn it on and everything's f- Remember Napster. What, what happened to mm-hmm. uh, downloading music like overnight music is free. So imagine putting a million zillion hours into what yeah. you're doing. And then someone's like, Oh, that's a nice song click. And then to the next thing and scroll that's, so yeah i think it knowing that back in the days of napster if if someone maybe would have explained it better maybe things would have went a different way i think the idea of copyright and all of that has Mm -hmm. is taken to the forefront and they're doing their due diligence on how to protect the what is it called the intellectual property of the artist but it's tough right? It's yeah. tough. And you can put all that effort in. And at the end of the day, if you're still if you, you're done producing, you're done recording, you're not getting any money. And yeah. that's the, the difficulty of being a musician. So you decided at a young age, you wanted to be a musician, you traveled this road, you worked in a bar, and then you worked your way up and you mentioned in the 40s. Is, is there something that you did consistently? Was it the music? Or were you doing other jobs along the side? Yeah, to bring, it was always to bring you to being the bass guy. Yeah, it was, it was always the music that was consistent. And the only reason it absolutely, I'm stubborn. It makes you no money. And I watched a lot of my other friends who are professional musicians. They eventually 99% of them give up and stop and go do something else. And I don't blame them. They have a family and get a career. Uh, but I'm kind of like a, a, a music, music holic. I'm addicted to music. I, I, I love it so much. And for me, it's, well, for everybody, it's, it's spiritual, right? If never mind, like a, I'm not, I don't want to diss anything, but a popular band or song or whatever, you know, it could be pop or, but when you see like a, a band play in Chicago or some like amazing band in Africa and everyone's dancing and like James Brown and it goes right through you. And I just, it shivers and, and it, people, I wrote this in one of my songs, people get married to music. Mm-hmm. People use music at their parties. People hire bands for their weddings, their bar mitzvahs, whatever. Music is always there on the game shows, on the TV. It is so, it's everywhere, all encompassing. But for some reason, it's free. Like for most people, I'm not talking about the, the industry and everything. I'm talking about most, pe- most musicians who work and gig. There's an old joke. Uh, the definition of a musician is someone who takes $5,000 of equipment, puts it in a $500 car, and then drives 50 mi- 500 miles to do a gig for $50. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of disheartening. My point yeah. is it's, it's a really prominent, important thing. It actually, Jimi Hendrix said that only music can, can save the world. Because mm-hmm. when you think about it, music actually bypasses all politics, all uh, you know, things that are going on in the world. It bypasses everything and it unites us all. And it's, it's everywhere. And it's so important. It makes you feel good. It makes you cry. It's when you watch a movie, it's usually 50% the music that makes you feel the emotions of the production you're watching. And uh, it's really, really, really important music. And, and I still haven't given up. Uh, I had like a, I, I, I went up like this. I started, like I said, dishwashing and being poor and all that. And I went right up and I got to a climax and I, I went through so much diversity. I don't know if we can talk about it all here. Some of it's personal. I went through a lot of like wars. And, and when I finally beat everything and I was doing well, my back and my spine cracked and I was in the hospital and I lost everything. So tiny violin. And uh, it's, that was about... What was that the crack from overwork or something in particular that happened? I've, I've thought about it and researched it and studied it and thought about it a lot. Um, when I was a kid in Montreal at Park Safari in Quebec, I was taken to a, a little circus thing and petting zoo, and I was put on a roller coaster, and I was about seven, eight years old. And the guy who 
who puts you on the roll call stairs smoking a cigarette. It was like 1981. No one gave a crap. And he puts me in the thing and he, I, he clicks and it doesn't click. And I start like saying, sir, sir, like, and I start crying and screaming and he starts the roller coaster and my thing didn't click down. And I went, uh, I thought I'll just hold on. The roller coaster started. It was a big roller coaster, like 20 feet tall. And it went up and I went flying like 50, 80 feet flying through the air. And I remember falling and I landed on my, my legs and then on my spinal column and I was winded. And back then, no, nothing happened. No one got sued. The, a couple of people lost their jobs, but that was about it. And that was my first major injury. I think that's where it stemmed from. I fell out of a, a roller coaster. And there might have been a hairline there. And then just the abuse, especially playing instruments and staying in a position for a long period of time, that might have added some stress to it. Yeah. And in school, like I didn't know it at the time, but when I think back, because I've studied what happened to me, uh, all through elementary and high school, I was taken home from school sometimes and taken to the hospital because I had incredible neck pain mm. and headaches and back pain and I never addressed to it. And then life just got busy and I just kind of never dealt with it. And then I also having to go through a lot of adversity, like I traveled the world a lot. I, I lost a lot of loved ones. Uh, everything I did was with like five bucks in my pocket. And I eventually became like a teacher at university and so I was like, okay, and I was getting paid well, I had a nice place. And then that's when I lost everything and had to start all over again. And that was about almost 10 years ago. And then I started the Bass Guy Show. What were you teaching? Uh, I was teaching music. I was uh, sometimes head of the bass department or just a general music teacher. And I lived in Scotland at that time. And I taught at Perth College uh, and it's a university as well. And I taught at Stowe. Uh, university in Glasgow and Glasgow University. I was working sometimes at three schools at once uh, every week, driving back and forth and stuff. So. You, you said things kind of crumbled at that point. Was that because of your back or was that for some other reason? Uh, in the, I used to jog a lot and I used to be really thin and healthy and ate well and I would jog in between playing music and everything. And um, one day in the summer around 2008, or nine, I was helping a friend dig a ditch. Here we are back to the ditch story. <laughs> and I, there you I go, it's a this. full circle. <laughs> and I was just helping someone garden and I was digging and then I went for a jog. And then I went home and I was living in a big apartment in Glasgow. And I woke up at two or three in the morning screaming my head off. And I went to go to the phone and I passed out and I woke up in my own sweat. And then I reached the phone and I called 911 and a nurse and some police came over and opened the door and I was taken away to the hospital. So, so it just, what happened, my L5 S1 disc just popped out, but like the size of like a finger, it was completely blocking my spinal cord and I could hardly walk and I was stuck on the floor. And I went through about, uh, I didn't get surgery straight, straight away. The NHS sucked. So I came to Canada and uh, I was seen to hear a lot. It wasn't even good here, though, too. I've got some horror stories of I just saw on uh, Twitter on uh, CBC that there was a man who went in the hospital complaining that he had like, paralyzed his hip or something. And the nurses and doctors thought he was like joking or like not seriously. And they kicked him out. They told him, go away. You're a good boy. And they were demeaning and everything to him. And that happened to me when I first went to the hospital in the West Island, Montreal, I was lying on a floor. The doors were open in the winter and the doctor told me to take a Tylenol and go home. And uh, I called the hospital and I gave them, holy shit, sorry for swearing. Mm. And, uh, they, they, and then they were like, oh, you can't talk to us like this and blah, blah, blah. But then someone picked up the phone and said, we just got this guy's MRI because I had done one. It's like, this guy needs to be in the hospital today. And so. the, ne the next day I was in surgery. And the, the doctor said they hadn't, the MRI person said like, you know, your whole spinal cord is blocked. You shouldn't even be walking. And there's lots of horror Brian, stories. Mm. Uh, Brian, it was pain. So I did all that and blah, blah, blah. And I worked through my life and I finally became something and someone, you know, I mean, just mean like I had, I had comfort and I achieved something. I was the first person in my family ever in my family to go to school and to become a teacher. And then that happened so everything was taken away so it's like to me in my head it was like 
no matter how much adversity there is and how hard things are and how many people die and how poor you are, and then you finally achieve something and then it's all taken away from you again. And I hate complaining about it or talking about uh-huh. it, but that's, that's what happened in my life. It's, of course, it's, it's been tragic or whatever, but I always wake up, make my bed and do the best I can, make some music and do something productive. And then you go online and people say, you suck, dude, get offline. <laughs> Oh, I know the trolls. Trolls, yeah. The trolls. So, so a troll is just someone who sits there and say, you know, they just say, you're, you're bald, you suck, you get out of here. And they don't realize you just spent 18 hours a day for 40 years to come to this point. And they're just like, you suck. I was teaching class yesterday and I, I like the movie just because of my upbringing, bringing, I guess, is the movie Annie. Annie, I saw that in the theater when it came out. Like, but she sings this song tomorrow. Right. It's going to be a bright new day tomorrow. tomorrow. Right. And then I had a lesson yesterday. It was, it was Aesop's fables, uh, I believe, or even in another book that I'm reading. And it's talking about tomorrow. The kid wanted to know about tomorrow. And his mom said, just go to bed. When you wake up, tomorrow will be here. And then he woke, he went to bed, woke up and it's like, mom, is it tomorrow? No, it's not tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day away. So he kept living his life trying to get to tomorrow, but eventually he learned that you need to make the best of today. So I see these two, the dichotomy between Annie looking for tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be better, but it's actually not true, right? Because you have to, what you said is make your bed, do what you can do today, because no matter what, what you're going through adversity, (laughs) is going to slap you in the face in many different forms. Yeah, totally. And and when I was in the the deepest darkest places, that's when I started reading books like Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Someone gave that to me when I was in India and I read it in one day and and uh, it was just like it's totally it makes sense. There's so many books that repeat the same theme that and everybody knows it. It's living in the now and that's why I personally chose to be a musician because in my mind you can have your nothing against it, but you can have your house and your car and your air conditioner and all the things that pollute the planet and cause uh, global warming. But you can have all those things, but you don't get to take them with you when you die. And you can give them to your kids and your kids can have a great life. But the same thing happens to me now. I would rather play music and have a soul and look at the birds and be in the now then be consumed by like, I need to have a credit card. And I, I used to be like that, but I need to have a house and a job and all that. Now for me, what's important is to, uh, you know, experience life as a human being and like all the joys and the pains and the music. And so I, 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 I think I sacrificed having, I could, I could have all that stuff if I want, mm-hmm. but because I picked music, I don't have any of that stuff. So I can, I can play music and I can, instantly warp into like zen buddha mode and play music and it's the best feeling in the world but i don't have all that other stuff and i don't know how it works brian because there are obviously a lot of musicians who do do really well so Mm -hmm. you said about experiencing life and i think how i've come to know you is through the bass guy show so how did that how did you kind of pick yourself up or encourage yourself to keep going to start with your own show um, well, when I was the second time I was in surgery and I was in for longer and I was on morphine and I'm in hospital and in don't move mode, I couldn't move or anything. I took a napkin and I wrote a rap song on morphine about my situation, like that I'm in the hospital and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's on my website somewhere, uh, baseguyshow.com albums. And I, there's a song called Spinal Rap. So I figured, oh, I can do that. And then when I got home, Actually, I had nurses coming to my house because I had to get cleaned and needles and everything because I was in a lot of pain. I was in bad shape. And I had a mixing desk and I put it right beside my bed and I kept just recording music. And it reminds me of a time that when I was a kid, I broke my, I forget what it was, my elbow or my wrist or something. It was my elbow. And I had a cast on, but I kept practicing guitar anyway. And I just kept, I'm not saying you should beat yourself up. Like, I hate this whole thing of like, you have to achieve whatever. It's a choice. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit on the couch and, 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 you know, do nothing. But I choose to do things um, because I think that life is so precious that I won't 
we won't be here soon. So that's why I like music. I like photography and, and filming and I make videos and do things because I know I've already seen it happen. I used to make videos 20 years ago that people are like, oh, look at this. There, there's you when you, you know, when you look at a photograph, the photograph is more valuable in your house, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. it's like you can see your child when they were a baby. Would you rather a big house or seeing your child when they were a kid? So I, I kind of, what I'm getting at is things are backwards. I think we put all of this emphasis and priority on things and materialism and capitalism, and we don't put it on uh, music. Med not to sound like a hippie, but meditation or music, or like you said, reading a book, like the simple things in life. We, we, were, we, we kind of punish those things. Like, oh, you're a musician, okay, so you get nothing. And oh, you're selling real estate, so you can have everything. And the real estate is what causes the pollution, in my opinion, big, huge, you know, houses everywhere and car sorry if i'm rambling i'm a bit tired no, it's today, okay Ryan. no 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 it's it's good but Busy how did day. the how did the bass guy show become what it is now as it, it's growing so i started uh in 2013 on a platform called concert window which is no longer around so it's retro it was uh folk musicians in new york and you were able to stream live and there was like a tip button and one day I just started to jam on a little tiny webcam. I found my computers in the garbage and they were given to me. And it was like one pixel and I was like hardly moving. And I, I, I got pieces of paper and I was like, this is a commercial break now. And I, I just got inventive. And, and then I just started streaming. Then people started watching and it was never a lot of people. It was always 10 people. But then those 10 people started sending me guitar strings and, and tipping, helping pay my internet bill. And uh, they kept supporting. So I kept just doing it. And I tried to go back to work and I broke my back again. And the doctor said to me, like, uh, you, you can't keep doing this because you could just like reach up for mm -hmm. a, cu a cup that falls and you might pull your back again. So I had to slow down. But so I thought, well, I'm at home. There's the internet. I'll just do it from home. And I just started, people were giving me, everything I have is secondhand because, you know, i.e. never any money. That's why I always, I always complain about it. And then I look like a grumpy guy, but everything I have is, is secondhand and found. I didn't buy anything and I didn't go on the internet because I wanted to, validation or approval. I wanted to buy a, a, a ham sandwich so I could eat, literally. And so I would do this and then I would work my butt off and then I would make like 20 bucks and I go to the store and I buy some bread and maybe one month I'll buy some guitar strings. And it just, it got better and better. The technology got better. And the fans helped out. And then in one year, in 2016, a group of people got together and they, uh, they got me a car. And the guy drove the car from Toronto to Montreal on the lawn during the live show and gave me the keys. And it was kind of like a pinnacle moment, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that happened. But then it happened again. I couldn't afford to keep the car. So I gave it away to my friend. So what is the premise of your show? I mean, you're very talented musically but you also do various things you have different people on interviewing <laughs> it's a show about a guy who's very frustrated for trying so hard a thousand million times and never getting there like but i i'm enjoying the music i'm having fun people like it and uh, people do support and i do thank the people who do support i know all of their names i know where they live i write them every day it's always the same 10 people um and so what was the question again, Brian? <laughs> well, just what, what is the, the premise of your show? Because I know that you're playing music at times, you're streaming your mm -hmm. music, you do that throughout it the change. week, it, but you also used interview. To yeah, I used to just jam, but even back in Scotland, I was watching Frankie MacDonald. I, I, was, I wrote to him and stuff, and I couldn't dream of having him on my show, but eventually that happened. And I used to just play, but then I had a friend come in, Dr. Nira Mumstead, one of my best friends in a jazz band, and he was a bit of a comedian, a very big comedian. And then we just started goofing around and then it turned into themes. So every week I was doing like space week or nature week or school week. And then I'd go out and do little, because my back hurts, I can't sit for and play for a long time. So I do segments and bits to, and then I to like take a break. But then I thought, why not be a one person show where I do all the music, the editing, the production, taken a guest and I'm using my feet and my hands. And really when I'm doing the show, Brian, I don't have a clue what's going on. I'm kind of like, Oh my God. Like, I, I, and people are just there. Like you didn't answer my question. And I'm like trying to fly the spaceship on like a $5 budget. 
and so it kind of it took years it was really bad for ages like it was the audio was out of sync 2013 14 it was tough technology wasn't as good and uh and then eventually it started to it's always changing i'm always trying to find the right format and i go back and forth and i know it drives people crazy but i'm trying to make it work but what it is is i say hello i play some music i'll interview frankie on wednesdays and then i'll show clips from my life from like traveling and doing things or someone else's life so it's kind of a variety show so i kind of i don't like you know like if you're a musician you hang out with musicians online and if you're a, a fisherman you hang out with fishermen online and on your instagram and stuff i've never really fit in anywhere because when i do my mu it is a music show i play bass i'm into funk and jazz but when i do my show it's i'm a bit weird it's kind of like wayne's world meets peewee herman it's it's not normal and and plus I'm always like, oh, I have no money and everything sucks, you know? So I'm not, I, I'm the worst person to be a broadcaster because I tell the truth. I just say that I'm having a crappy day. And so I don't fit in with the, ba the base music community. I feel, I shouldn't think what they think, but I feel like I don't fit in there because they're all just doing music, but I'm like Pee Wee Herman show. So I don't really, I don't fit in in, in anywhere. So I'm trying to, but I'm just doing my own thing. I, I don't watch other people. I don't care what anyone else is doing. Uh, I just focus on what, what I want to do and not, I don't mean like, like egotistically, I just mean, I want to play bass, mm -hmm. but then for me, music's boring. Cause I've done it for 40 years. It can get boring. So I'll go out and film some stuff and make a movie. So it'll be music and interview and then something different. And I'll, it's very interactive. I talk to the guests and everything, but for a long time, it's like Frankie said, he didn't know how to deal with trolls until his friends helped him. Um, sometimes like, yeah, when I do my show, the musicians are like, how come you're not playing bass right now? What are you doing? You're acting all weird. And then when I play music, another group of people are like, how come you're not talking to us? I'm trying to tell you what kind of soup I had today. And so I'm trying to please every, so I've went through all that stuff and now I just have to have fun and enjoy doing it. And the show's actually, the show's kind of always at its best. It's ne it never gets worse. It gets better. Um, as, as far as like, you know the technology and and it's nothing it's not a huge deal i'm just talking in front of my computer and playing music but if you take a step back and realize what i'm doing like playing the drums the bass the guitar doing the sounds doing the video everything all alone on like windows 1995 it, it's it's pretty fun it's a challenge it's a challenge <laughs> Well, maybe this is the theme you were talking about at the beginning, mm -hmm. that when you, you were delivering papers to the more affluent people, their homes, yeah. and then you learned a little bit along the way. What I appreciate about you and watching your show, this is what magnifies me. This is what attracts me to what you do, is the way you treat people. And, and it's almost like I have to watch you just to see how you are going to react to the people you have on your show or the way that you're handling, you know, that you're one man band here with all that you're doing, but you do it in such a calm, caring and compassionate manner that it, it's very intriguing. And I'm talking, I guess, specifically about dealing with people and I don't mean dealing, but interacting with people say on your Wednesday show where you have a bunch of people, and they're from different backgrounds. And it's just the way you, you have this heart about you with people that I think we could all learn from. So I guess my question is, how can we learn to treat people better? Yeah, well, well put, Brian. Um, I wish it was all true. I want it to be true. I, I am personally am like that. My whole life, I got that from my dad. If there's one thing that I got from my dad was that my dad taught me from a kid never to put a tiniest bit of paper on the ground, like just do not pollute and open the door and stuff. And I've always treated everyone as equals my whole life. Even like things like important things like children, you know, when people talk to kids or they're a little dog and they're like, Oh, Johnny, aren't you a good boy? Look what you did. I'm like, Hey, Johnny, what are you doing? Like, get out of the way. You know, if I'm being mean and if I'm being nice, I'll be like, Oh, that's pretty cool, man. If you mm -hmm. treat, I, I used to work with kids. I used to work in schools. And if you treat children, I don't even think about it. I don't do it on purpose as a trick. 
I actually treat children as an equal. If there's anybody with a, a disability or a difference, or they look different, I always go over. My, my main concern is who is the most insecure person in the room? Who's having the most trouble? Who's the most shy? Who's the, and, and go say, would you like some food? Are you okay? Do you want some space? In my head, that's going on. I go out of my way. I learned that from my dad, just to everyone's equal. Everyone gets a chance. And, and, and that's how I've lived my whole life. But the big but is from doing this and the, the self-inflicted stress of it all is the internet is a breeding ground for trolls. And we live in an age, not everybody, but we live in an age of cynicism and self-importance uh, and entitlement. And it's like everyone's God-given right to just go, no, you suck. No, you suck. Get out of the way. That's too fast. That's too slow. Look at you. You're bald. This sucks. You know, so, and that you, you constantly get that, not all the time, but it's always coming in from somewhere. So you have to have thick skin and you just, you, you wish you could just block them and just, but you know what? I, um, Sarah Soller said it to me best once, like you can take these things and be strong or whatever, but you're a human being, like whether it's you or me or even the troll we're real, real people. And when you constantly tell someone, you know, that something bad, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's your human being. And no matter how like Zen you are or whatever, it does affect you. You will think about it. And so when you put yourself out there, which I want, cause I want to do music, I'm entertaining the world for free for fun. I've put my whole life into entertaining for free and you put yourself out there, but then you're also putting yourself out there to all of that uh, we, we live in an age of narcissism and like TikTok, like videos of people dancing and showing their bodies for 10 seconds who get 80,000 million views. And then they can use that momentum to it, like, you know, monetize on it or whatever. And so you, that's another form of troll trolling for me is like just a, how like uh, things have changed completely. Like back in the day, there was drum sets and amplifiers and people would go to the bar and talk to each other and you'd play and you like, you'd even like, you know, give a signature or you get one. If you were a fan, like when I was a kid, I'd watch bands, but nowadays it's just like when you're, I, I, this happened like 10, 15 years ago, I've done gigs in restaurants or bars or parties and the band is like in the way people just walk by and talk and laugh. And it's not like we're important or whatever, but it, it, times have changed. So it's just like music has become this thick, a tool for people to, to, to use. And they've forgotten what it means to, to be a, to know what a scale is or a feeling or blues or whatever. So uh, I know I'm wandering all over the place no, here, but these okay. are, this is why I sometimes react to those trolls or whatever, mm -hmm. because um, it's like, you've put so much into it and you're, I've spent my whole life like trying to treat everyone as an equal and have fun. And then someone who's, basically has a mental health problem dedicates their time to try to ruin what you're doing they hate you because they ain't you or whatever cliche but it's so i've been getting better at it for the last couple of weeks i've just started to ignore everything and dive into the music and to having fun and and i and i do i get there my favorite things are just like i said i wake up i make my bed i love feeding the birds i love nature and uh, just having a nice meal with a loved one and producing a show, I'm in heaven, really. But I wouldn't mind a couple thousand million dollars to make it, you know, all worth it in the end, Brian. Well, you're being honest, right? You said you're wandering. You're not wandering because you were saying, well, I appreciate the fact of what I'm saying to you that you seem like very seem like a very compassionate and caring person to your guests and how you manage things. But then you're also saying, well, that that is true, but also these trolls or these other parts of life kind of bother me. So I'm not, you know, yeah, so it's saintly. not even so much the trolls because they're just one or two, but it's more like what I was getting at that the industry that we live in, I've, I've come this far and I'm doing all this stuff. It's not that great or anything, but I'm, I'm enjoying it and it is something. And then I turn around and, and it's been going on for 10 years, Brian, I look and I just see people being so successful and making money and doing things. And they're talking about like what sandwich they ate or they're showing their boobs or their butt or their biceps or whatever. Like they're not even doing anything. They're just That's talking. huge here in Korea. People just <laughs> eating, eating, just eating in front of a YouTube, yeah. you know, this is their thing. And they got millions of followers and they're making lots of money uh, mm -hmm. by just shoving food in their. <laughs> and I think it's, it's like culture has gone backwards. Can you imagine Michelangelo? 
drawing helicopters in, in the 16, 1400s or whatever, and then large orchestras and Mozart and Bach and everything. And then in the 20s, there was all the jazz bands and Glenn Miller and everything. And now it's just like, mm-ch, 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 mm-ch. I like bums mm-ch, mm-ch, mm-ch. or whatever. That's probably going to be the next hit. So it's, 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 and now videos are 10 seconds long and everyone's scrolling and everyone's got ADHD cucumber seven, five, you know, everyone's just all over the place scrolling. And even like my friends were trying to eat dinner. Everyone's just scrolling. There's no, there's no focus anymore. And people don't understand, uh, you know, art, painting, composition, reading books, music, not to be like a, a snob or whatever. I'm not a snob. I'm poor. And I'm my favorite show is the trailer park boys. And I love to swear. I, uh, but, but I do know I can appreciate and I can see like good stuff. And I know a lot of people do and can, and it always exists in small pockets, but on the mass scale, I just see people going to, I just see people going to uh, Best Buy and buying huge screen TVs and no one has a stereo anymore. I, 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 I sound like a pessimist, but it's because that's the industry I'm in. I'm in the industry of music and playing music. And people are like, do you want to do a show at my daughter's wedding for uh 50 bucks and a sandwich and it's it's really insulting basically that's I funny wish... i remember university at a, a, a high school we didn't think of buying a tv we bought a stereo right Good. growing growing up like you bought you know a walkman or something a but not funkin right not some big screen to watch something that that's interesting point i never thought yeah, of it, it used an album used to be an artwork and a cover and you'd open it and you'd have to take the bus to go buy it and then you'd listen to it with your friends and it was social and it's, I sound like, an I know I sound like an old man saying, Oh, well, back in my day, but it's gotten so bad now that like just music, movies, film, I can go watch a movie that costs $2 million for free. I can just illegally download it and watch it. What happens to all those people that, you know, well, they're in the industry, but, um, and part of the reason I'm going dark right now is because I'm tired. I've had a long, long day in my back. You're busy. Hurts, you but... are on TV <laughs> and you were on TV today. You had your show debut with uh, Frankie, no? Yeah, cable14.com. We were live with uh, Dylan A. Tack and Frankie. It was my first time on real TV today in Hamilton, Ontario. So it's near Toronto. You're, you're a talented musician, but what is some skill that you've had to develop, say, over the last seven years as you've been putting your content online? Something that even now you're still working on. Yeah, totally. It's like how to balance the workload, not to put too much on. Uh, I, used to do, I used to do 10 shows a week. So it's obviously too much. <laughs> I, I, I brought it back to three. If you're good at math, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's too much. So I'm doing the graphics, the artwork, the stills, it takes three hours, four hours of setup to take down. There's all the pre and post stuff like on social media. And, and then when you make a video, you have to format it to all different social media mm-hmm. and it's all encompassing. So a half hour show will take me 18 hours and I'll stick that up and it'll get 27 views, but I keep going and I keep trying and I'm learning to work smarter, not harder, and uh, to, to make things shorter and have more fun. But then it, I'm conflicted because I used to stream three or four hours so that I can make tips to eat food. Because if you play the Beatles and the Eagles and you play pop songs or whatever, people like it, they can relate to it. And then they go, oh, I'm having fun. Here's five bucks. But if you do a really good show that's 20 minutes long and you produce it and you work super hard and you get guests and everything and you no one's going to tip because they're just like, Oh, thank you for the show that you just did. So I'm always conflicted between do I play for a long time on like a lesser known app and just let my hair down or do I make a polished show? So I have a product. So I'm, I'm learning how to balance all of these things and keep sane and have a good life at the same. And I'm doing well, but then Frankie calls me and says, bass guy, you're going to be on the Brian V show bass guy. You're going to be on cable bass guy. And I always say yes to Frankie because I absolutely love love him to bits. He's one of, he's one of my best friends. We talk on the phone almost every day and stuff. And he's just such a, he's an inspiration. He's what we need. And the reason people like Frankie is back to all that trolls and cynicism and, and stuff going on. Frankie is just a breath of fresh air. He's so positive all the time. He's so polite. And if anyone starts to talk bad, he'll just like, won't react basically he's a great guy frankie i asked frankie what should people do if they're they face adversity watch my videos <laughs> <laughs> he did that today on on tv uh the person after me was a famous comedian and there was a famous hockey player 
and they asked Frankie, like, uh, Frankie, can you name us uh, a fun fact about yourself? And he gave out his website address, <laughs> <laughs> his YouTube address, Dogs and Wolves. <laughs> He's always on point. And I yeah. think we would be a miss too, because I, I listened to you on another podcast and you had mentioned this and I didn't know, but uh, Peter Galenko, you and I, have, you have him on your show a lot. And I owe yeah, a lot Pete. to him too, because he has given you viewers and viewers to myself as well. And thinking whether we're thinking of Frankie with his view and perspective on things. I think Peter has a great view and perspective on things too, in the adversity that he faces and is still working hard and has a positive attitude as he does so. Yeah, totally. I think that's why like people attract uh, to each other, like Frankie and Pete, Pete used to call me a little bit. We talk and he, I think he's a great smart guy. Yeah, And uh, he's so. like you said, adversity and he's going through stuff and he keeps going and he's always, he's always lifting people. And this is the whole thing I could boil everything down to is that one uh, cliche quote that no good deed goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. And it literally is true. You can do something good and for free and give it away and you will have people jump on you. Um, you can just ignore it and get on. But why not the, do the other thing? Why not lift people? Like I see that in everyone. Like everyone's enough who cares if you're a musician or you have a show or whatever you do everyone is enough just the way they are like mr rogers said i like you brian just the way you are you don't need to do anything you already are enough but why not lift people and say like that's a good picture that you just drew or mm -hmm. i like that i like that you know poem that you wrote or and and people are very quick to like pa passive aggressive is is very uh, a prominent today people are passive aggressive i think most of the people who start crapping on each other and giving each other a hard time they're not even aware that the reason they're doing it is because they're having a bad life and they're grumpy and they're feel like life's unfair or they had a bad day and then so they take it out on the internet later on someone's mm -hmm. show or whatever yeah i so, think a lot of people... I, I like pete for lifting people up and i can see that you and you too brian you know he he gets a lot of heat because he's in the crypto field and so people i think are less sympathetic not in crypto but you're dealing as we mentioned before about money not talking about money but that's where people tend less to take their their heart with them i mean not in, in the strictest way but i think I see, I mean, yeah if you do this then you're a bad person like if you work for esso then you're bad you know it doesn't work like that it's more to life than he takes what, a lot it, of criticism yeah he does i think he does he takes and frankie too i think takes a lot of even though he has a lot of love out there and stuff like you, you take a lot. So, um, they have yeah. tough chins. Yeah. I, I mentioned this earlier and you mentioned this just now, but Aesop's fable, my dear wife bought me the, this book for my students, but we thought it was bigger. It's, only this big. <laughs> it's small. It, it, looked big, more. it looked big on the phone, but the one that's called, I just read it the other day, the, the old woman in the wine jar in the, in the, the premise or the, the lesson is the memory of a good deed lives. An old woman picked up an empty wine jar, which had once contained a rare and costly wine, and which still retained some traces of its exquisite boutique bouquet. She raised it to her nose and sniffed it at again and again. Ah, oh, she cried, how delicious must have been the liquid which has left behind so ravishing a smell. So the idea of doing these good things, and again, the, the lesson was called... Uh, the memory of a good deed lives. So as long as we're doing these good things, whether you're talking about Frankie, you're talking about Peter, you're talking about yourself or myself, doing these or anyone else listening, doing these things is really what's going to win over at the end of the day. Totally. Exactly right. Just, just be, between everything today, I saw an old friend I hadn't seen in a while. And we actually uh, were in like 20 years ago, we were both like going through a crazy time in Poland. It was a huge adventure. And we saw each other today and we're like, that thing that happened in Poland, man, that was totally worth it. That was so fun. It's the memory. And if you, and if you do and a good intention or a good deed, you're right. It's, it's the reason why we work because it does stay, the intention will stay uh, in, it will live forever. Or like when someone dies, uh, you know, to live in the hearts of others is not to die. So as soon as you just bring up the topic, the song, the person, it just becomes alive again. And that intention is the seed of goodness and love and what can be more powerful than that you know 
I know you're you're tired and we're on a time restraint. I don't want to keep you too long. So it's all I'll, good. It's I'll all good. jump through some things. But what about Patreon? I, I'm wondering this because I know you have a Patreon account. So how do how does that work? And and how could people connect with you? And I'm just you know anyone listening to to go to that. But how does that work? I I know very little about it. Yeah, it's a good question. I've tried lots. I've tried. I've tried everything and often I get people with good intentions saying, you should try this, you should do that. And I'm like, oh, that thing I did seven times and it didn't work. So out of all the things, I went back to Patreon because it's, it's sta- technically it's stable and it's there and everything. But from as little as like, I think, I think it can be anything, but I think it's from like as little as $2 a month. Mm-hmm. It's like if you're watching someone show all the time and you're their friend or whatever, you know, if for two bucks a month, you can pay more if you, if you want, you, uh, you get some rewards. So on my Patreon, I keep it super simple. I really, I know gimmicks are good and they work and it's, we live in an interactive world. So it's always like rewards and do this and interactive and stream labs and OBS and do this, and, but it becomes a nightmare because there's so much stuff going on. So my Patreon is super simple. There's like three things you can join and pay like two bucks a month and help what I do. You don't have to. And then you get to see rare videos that no one else can see. Mm -hmm. So stuff from years ago, like when I was doing crazy shows, you get to see those. And, but the main thing is there's no pressure. You can leave whenever you want. And uh, what you're actually doing is you're just helping me pay the internet bill so I can keep doing the show. Mm -hmm. And I've been on it for about a year and a half. I've got nine Patreons. It's not a lot, but they're great people. They're loyal. They help out. It, I've almost reached the goal. Imagine this. I've been doing this for seven years and, and uh, I haven't, I can't afford to pay my internet bill with my show yet. And I, and I hate being grumpy and talking about it, but at the same time, I don't want to do it for free all the time because it's mm-hmm. painful enough already. So it's Patreon. I don't even know what it is, but it's on my website, baseguyshow.com, B-A-S-S, baseguyshow.com. And what on is- there, there's, there's a whole bunch of like, I, that's yeah. the thing I forget, Brian. I'm a musician. I have albums. And uh, I, I think I've made, I can't remember. I shouldn't talk about money, but over 10 years, I've not made a lot. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, like, it's like 20 bucks a month or something, not even. But uh, I make albums. So like, why not, you know, there's t-shirts, there's albums or whatever. And you have my a merch, main goal. Merch section, yeah. Yeah. And, and my goal is to actually pay the internet bill. So I know a lot of these shows or whatever might be, raking in money and doing well or someone's on tiktok and they're monetizing and making thousands of dollars per post i'm just trying to pay like a 95 dollars internet bill and i can't even do that but i don't give up i keep going i think any sane person would have given up years ago i keep doing it and, you, you uh, mentioned the idea of being say in a bar where people are walking by the musicians talk about being on YouTube, for instance, and the importance of likes, comments, shares, all of those things, because I think people, even I, I find myself and sometimes accidentally, because I, I don't know why, but my YouTube is not, um, I'm not logged into my YouTube on my phone, which I have to do. So when I go to like something, I can't because I'm not logged in, but I watch lots of things and I probably don't do what I should do because, you know, that helps the, the content creator. So yeah, what is it, your view it, on that? It is weird because YouTube is probably the strongest platform because the whole world uses it. The videos are there, but people do not use it for social media. They're not on there saying, hey, how's it going or whatever. There are, like, there are millions of people on YouTube, but generally people go on Facebook to talk to each other right, mm-hmm. and be social. And on YouTube, it's just kind of a thing that you'll just stick on your Facebook and talk about it on Facebook. I don't use Facebook, by the way. I'm, I'm completely, I have one and I, I use it to talk to my mom. I'm anti-Facebook. I can't stand it. Yeah. Oh, I don't, sorry to bring that up. I can't stand mm. it. But, but YouTube is like, people aren't, except for creators, people aren't really using it. And YouTube's weird because if you click on what's trending, my jaw drops. It, again, it's just like <laughs> the, the death, it's like the Roman Empire crumbling. There's just someone like, hey, everybody, today we're going to make the Zip Zap song. And then there's like chickens everywhere and stuff. And it's just like, what the hell is going yeah, on? People wonder We've gone why from the world's John Coltrane to. Yeah. <laughs> so I always go back to that thing. But um, YouTube, yeah, 
I don't get much help with the algorithms. I, I, I just keep using it because it's a strong platform. I have other channels there too, but I don't really get any help from YouTube or creators. Well, I'm doing everything wrong or something. But it but is helpful it. though, right? For people who are taking in content to like, to share those little things, even if you're not contributing to a Patreon or some other yeah. means of, of income is those likes and shares, they do help in the algorithm, which it's hard to understand. I don't understand it all, but I think just those comments, you know, it was good. You know, thank you. Mm -hmm. I like those things. And not only that, I think they put something in our, in our, our um, productive bank, right? It's an investment to show, oh, that person liked it. That's good. And I think you could get too caught up in who liked it or who disliked it or who says what. And, but I think generally those things are important for the algorithm, but they're also important for you as a content if you create a show an episode and a bunch of people like it it's something that you like as well yeah sometimes that happens the video goes well everyone was in a great mood there's comments and stuff but then sometimes i'll put in a video with much more work or whatever and nothing will happen happened. not a single comment no and then the subscribers will just stay the same for like three months like how can it not go up or down so it's just like how does it just all of a sudden and then nothing? Mm -hmm. I feel like the numbers, like not just YouTube, but everywhere, all these were, we're all consumed by views mm -hmm. and numbers, which is validation and approval. And it's like, I'm like, yeah, but did you like John Coltrane's solo? <laughs> or is it about like, you could have 27 million yeah. likes and be the biggest idiot in the world who's not producing anything of was it, worth. What was you know? that movie, Jerry Maguire? Wasn't it the babysitter <laughs> talking to... Tom Cruise is like, wasn't it John Coltrane? I'll need to watch that. I think I, I think caught he my was eye like, the other day. Do, do you ever, but do you really listen to the music? <laughs> he was, he was like, and then I think he was talking to the kid, <laughs> just okay. trying to get, trying to change the world a little bit at a time. Yeah. What is your, your overall goal for the base guy show or to some other goal? To, to one day be able to afford a gold suit so that people know Sorry. how, how successful I am. That's an old dumb joke I had since I was a kid. If I get rich, I'll buy a gold suit, like actual gold. Mm -hmm. So when I walk around, people will say, hey, that guy's successful. That's a hard to walk around in a gold my, suit. My goal is always the same thing. And I, I'm the one who forgets it first, is to have fun and enjoy myself and put some love and positivity in the world. But I think through all the adversity, I'm 46. And I've almost killed myself a thousand times trying to produce something or become a teacher or do music. Mm -hmm. And the end result is like, you know, having no food in the fridge. It's like, F man, like, really? Like, why am I doing this? So I asked myself, why am I doing this? And I think it's really because of, for, for a lot of the reasons is I, I've lost a lot of people in life, like friends, brothers, people have died. And I, I kind of do it for them because I think that they're in heaven and they're looking down and they're saying like, you know, Jack, you know, or everybody, everyone, you know, like do, do it, do something good. Like keep, keep running, keep going. Mm -hmm. That's why I do it. I don't know if that sounds crazy, but it's like a voice in my head telling me to keep going. Well, it could be a, a worse voice in your head telling you to do something else. And I could be, it could be just that I'm really, really bad. Maybe I'm crap. Maybe I'm a jerk. That's totally possible too. I, well, I think we all have a little jerkiness in us. <laughs> it depends but, on how much we show and how much we display. I know there is no success and there is no goal. You're supposed to just live and thrive and do better and stuff. But I just, I, my whole point with this whole conversation is like that I talk about a lot in my show is if you, if you do go through all these trials and tribulations through your whole life, like not like once or twice, sometimes I hear people say like, oh yeah, I've been doing my podcast now or my, I've been doing this for seven months now. And like, they're on TV and famous now, you know, seven months. And hey, like, hey, oh. you're on TV. Seven, it took you seven <laughs> years, but you're was, on today. Yeah, seven, yeah, today. Yeah. So I started in 19, like 84, I think. And I, I still have nothing in the fridge. So I'm kind of like, hey man, like what's, what's going on? You know, like, and so then I talk about it and I'm completely honest. Like now I completely just talk about, I'm, these are just my opinions and they might mm -hmm. change. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm trying to be honest. And so, and they say that, that you should be yourself and have fun.
but when I do that, it doesn't work either. <laughs> so, <laughs> is, is there something about you that people don't understand or the, the work that you're doing, right? As the a podcast host, a musician, that people don't understand that you would like them to understand so they may get a better appreciation of the work you bring to the table? There's these screaming voices in my head nonstop. And there's this producer called Larry who ruins everything. Is this? I love the Larry, right? This is. And... <laughs> Let's hear it for Larry. Larry's my fall guy. He's an imaginary producer. Um, anything I'd like people to know that, like, I'd like them to send that, um, yeah, I wish, like, in this whole hour conversation, there was like two words I could use instead. Just mm -hmm. to say, like, you, know, you never know what someone else has been through. So never, ever dare judge anyone, and including myself. I, I, we should never, you never know what someone's been through. Um, I, really, I really wish that people would um, take a step back and stop consuming so much uh, physically and mentally and just stop and slow down. And if you're going to watch my show or Brian's show or eat a banana or just stop and focus and, and look and look at something and realize like, you know, that, that there's a history behind it and there's all the stuff behind. If you keep scrolling and doing this and going to the store and get it, blah, blah, blah. It's just, everyone's just kind of literally, Brian, you go out in the street and I see people driving in their cars while looking at their phone. Like we've actually gone insane. Yeah. I want, if I wish people could understand what music is rather than just a candy or something that you turn on to feel good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most of the reasons most of the people will enjoy music is they don't even know why. And that's the whole point. You're supposed to have fun, but I really wish people would like enjoy music again and go back into it and take a step back from all the, the bullshit. You mentioned a couple of times adversity in, you know, losing family members, losing friends, breaking your back a couple of times. Is there some particular adversity that you have faced that either encourages you or hinders you in your work, but you can also use that adversity to encourage people in the adversity they face in their work? Yeah, that you're, whatever you're going through, even if it's the worst thing, even if it's like leading to death, whatever, you're not alone. People love you. And, uh, you know, stuff that some people, they, they make movies about, I think like in the old days, uh, first nations would tell stories and that's how they told stories to the children to teach things. Now in today's culture, it's movies. Did you see the movie about the plane that crashed in the mountains and mm -hmm. they had to eat each other? So they got through that, right? Well, some of them did. And like you said, the, the story went on forever and made many, many more people be aware of that adversity. So if whatever, it's really important too, because some people like give up and, or think they have to give up or whatever. My, my thing is like, don't give up, reach out to someone. And if you're completely alone, just keep going because there is nothing else. You're just in now, even if it's shitty and in pain, I'm in pain and it's not mm -hmm. been easy, but I'm still, I still think that it's worth living. And, and if you focus on what you have or don't have, like I'm talking about, you, you forget to like, look at the birds and stuff and go mm -hmm. for a walk and have fun. So don't give up. Like you're not alone. Yeah. You're touching on that too, is because when people are faced with dire adversity, they end their lives. And here in South Korea, it's, I think next to New Zealand, it's one of the highest rates of suicide in the world because people feel, and it's usually coming from middle school, high school students who are not doing as well as they're supposed to be doing by the, the regulations or the expectations of parents and teachers and because they bottleneck them so much that everyone's supposed to be the best, which you know, working, yeah, making 10 awful. shows out of seven days a week, it's impossible mm -hmm. to do, you know, very hard to accomplish. Then they feel in utter despair and jump yeah. off an apartment building. That's the really bad thing about culture and stuff. Like on one important side note is we're, we're not doctors, obviously, but there are mental health issues and that requires professional, you know, mm -hmm. like that, that whole thing is different because people talk about stuff but if you're bipolar, schizophrenic, Tourette's, all that stuff, you can't tell someone to cheer up and keep going because it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. But there is there is help out there. So on a side note, we're not doctors. Mental mm -hmm. health is really serious, important. Um, 
And I think all the technology and craziness is amplifying that now. And there's, there's more suffering in the world, but the part about culture, whether it's over there or here of like, we, from birth, you're taught to like, you know, from a, from a girl, you're taught to like, you know, want a pink dress and you're going to get married and you're going to have a big house and the guy has to be tough. And f- right from birth, you're completely trained. It's even worse probably in Russia and stuff like that. Uh, we put so much pressure on ourselves to achieve all these things. And it goes right back to Mr. Rogers, who, uh, you know, he, he, he campaigned and went to the White House and, and Parliament, uh, I forget what it was called, but he, he went on. What was it that uh, Mr. Rogers did? He went to the, the Senate. To the Senate. And yeah, and he was talking about like, it's important to keep a show going and everything and about mm-hmm. children. And his whole message to children and to people was that you are enough. You, you don't need to be anything. You don't need to do anything. It's okay to be sad or unhappy or have problems. You're, we live in a politically correct world right, right now, like totally politically correct, where everyone's supposed to be involved in what good. That's a good thing. But you are enough just the way you are. But people always feel like, oh, I'm not good looking mm-hmm. enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too stupid. I'm so smart. And I'm a nerd. So nobody likes me. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. I need more money. I, I, you're, you're enough the way you are. You're perfect the way you are. And we don't remind each other of that a lot. And I do that on my show all the time. Even though I, I talk a lot of crap and I'm always grumpy and poor, I'm always trying to tell people that you are enough the way you are. You don't need validation or approval. You're perfect. I love Mr. Rogers. I think yeah, he he's great. That, that show, I watch it every now and then, like once a month, I watch an episode. I was a little bit disappointed <clears throat> with Tom Hanks because in his interviews for that movie that he did, he was saying, Mr. Rogers is only for kids because, you know, as a, when you grow up, you realize that his show was not for the reality of this life. Like he said that a few, those were his talking points on the interviews. And I was like, no. I think I watch Mr. Rogers now and his shows are very applicable on how I can treat people well and how a better way to look at the world. That's what Mr. Rogers does. He's like, he has episodes where he talks to kids. He's like, are you angry? Why are you angry? And then he'll talk about anger Mm -hmm. or when JF, like in the movie, when John F. Kennedy got shot, he talked about it on his show. He talked about an assassin blowing someone's head off. How does that make you feel, Johnny? You know, like really heavy, heavy yep, stuff, it was. racism and yep. politics and all this stuff. And he would ask, he would address the problem, like, 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 let's talk about your feelings and where they come from and why you've that. I think that would help adults. Like we you should, said. we like, should all watch more Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Just a, a, a Rogers loop. Is there anything else that we haven't touched upon, Jack? Is there something that we haven't mentioned that you would like to mention? Uh, everybody should go watch Frankie McDonald's videos. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I just, I want to say that I like, uh, despite my grumpy mood today or whatever, uh, I want to thank everybody who's ever like encountered my life and passed my way and been part of the show or whatever, put up with me. Uh, love to everybody. Thanks for putting up with me. And there's so many good people out there like Billy D and sloppy and Lynn and this guy, John, I just met. And there's just people like, Mills Motors and Sock Cop and uh, Mickey and, and Gajen. I could go on forever mm-hmm. and they're just amazing, wonderful people. So thank you for being part of uh, the, the therapy. Well, that's that's what you were saying is when you first started, there's been this consistent group with you along the way and it, it becomes, you know, friends, but like a, a family of people who really support you. And those are the ones you never want to forget. Yeah. And through it, like I said, seven years. So a lot of people have gone, but they're still Mm -hmm. there. And some of them creep back and say hello. And there's no pressure. There's no rules. And I'm really just an idiot on the internet talking like this and playing guitar. And yeah, I think it's, it's fun. Uh, The the premise of my show, this is the one thing I had a best friend. His name was, uh, we'll just say Velcro. That was his stage name. And he was one of my best friends, music friend. And he uh, used to call on the show and be a member of the show, like for about two years and uh, he, he passed away and he died. And the very beginning of my show, there's some uh, spoken word over the theme song. And it's my friend Richard said that to me. He used to call and leave messages on the show. And he said, um, let's stay in touch because it's important contact. It's good contact. We need that contact. And we're only going to die one day and we're going to go on living into another format. Base guy loves you, no fear. And that's on the end or beginning of every show, depending on how I do it. So 
uh, when he passed away, I kind of was going through my own thing, but it just solidified everything mm -hmm. that his message and his love, I'm still doing the show in his name. I actually have a, his card here in his name and I look at it every day and, uh, you know, and other people too, but he really inspired me to, uh, he went through the hardest time in the world ever. And he said to me, you got to keep in touch, keep going. Cause whatever you're doing, it's important. Just keep going. And I thought that was a beautiful message from yep. a, a best friend. Yeah. Great to have friends like that who support you and encourage you along the way. How can people reach you, Jack? Uh, it's bassguyshow.com. So B A S S as in the bass guitar, bassguyshow.com. And everything's on there. Like there's, it's just, it's hand delivered on a silver platter, all the different links and things like that. You, you say you're an idiot and I agree that I'm an idiot, but you have some special skills. So good on you. I mean, I suggest people go check you out. Uh, you are talented with the, the instruments that are around you with the microphone in front of you with all those buttons and you're creative in your show. And as I said, you're very compassionate with the people that you have on and caring and that, and that shows no matter what we have going on in our minds. But I have one final question for you. Yep. Why do you work? Because I just think because, because we're here and we're alive, we call it work, but it could just be being mm -hmm. and doing things not to get too Zen, but why does anybody do anything? And for me personally, waking up, making my bed and producing something and making something and putting some love, despite all the complaining I did, when I do music every day, I literally, the hair stand up on, my back, on the back of my neck daily, hourly, because I'm doing music and I'm, like, I'm secretly having the time of my life. The only time I'm free and I have feel no pain is when I'm working. So I work because it just, I get, I, I feel, I'm, I'm aware that I'm a conscious entity in the universe. I wasn't here before. I won't be there in the future. I am now, and I'm very conscious of that. So I try to make the best I can. Everywhere I've lived, I've put pictures on the wall or, or like flowers over there, or just like I, I completely, completely am grateful for existing. And I try to do the best I can while I'm here all the time. Yeah, my perspective on life in that, Work is a good thing despite the difficulties we have in it. I think once, when it all ends, the difficulties are gone, work is still a good thing. And I think the work that you're doing is wonderful. And I suggest people to check you out. Jack Thank Casey, you, Brian, eh? The Bass Guy Show. I appreciate this time that you have given me and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for your time. I'm Brian V. And that was Jack Casey with the base guy show find him the base guy show the base guy show.com you can subscribe like comment uh, and share this interview you can find me on any podcast host apple spotify google stitcher if you want to be a guest or you know someone that would make a great guest email me at why we work brian v at gmail.com why we work Brian V at gmail.com. I would like to uh, talk to you. I'm Brian V, and this is why we work.